church up in Reading 12 years ago called The Stirring, just celebrated 12 years. Uh, and if you've ever met a, a, a church planner, they're crazy. They're half quarter crazy on their mom's side, full crazy on their dad's side. And uh, any, anybody that's crazy enough to plant a church, I should know, uh, they, they have great, great stories to tell. And so our speaker today has got some incredible stories to tell. Uh, really encouraged. I feel like the church he's building is like five, six years ahead of where we are, but we're building something very similar together, which is exciting. And uh, one of my favorite things uh, about Nate is that he's an Old Testament preacher. So he goes OG from the Bible every time he gets up there. He's always using stories and texts and verses. And, and as I read the Old Testament, I just, full disclosure here, as I read the Old Testament, I actually... Look at Nate and I think about what an Old Testament character would look like today. That would be Nate, right? Wavy hair, glasses, and the beard to prove the Old Testament prophet. Let's stand on our feet, put our hands together, and give a warm experience welcome to Pastor Nate Edwardson. Thank you, Mark. Um, I don't always preach Old Testament, but I'm definitely preaching Old Testament this morning. So uh, come on, just uh, because uh, Mark gives me a hard time about it. Um, but just a real honor to be with you guys. We've heard so many stories about what God's doing through experience, and um, we love Mark and Amanda, your pastors, and we've met, we've, quite a bit of your team have been up in Reading, and we've spent time together, and so it's just an honor to finally get the face of experience and one of the things I love about Mark is Mark is um, such an encourager, and it takes a massive amount of courage to put courage into others, because the only way you can do that, the only way that you can put courage into other people is when you're not competing with them anymore, and when you're not comparing yourself to them, and there's too many church leaders, people in general, the church, but there's so many church leaders that because of their insecurities, they're comparing themselves or they're competing with other leaders rather than being a champion and putting courage in them. So um, I just, man, honor, honor your pastors because they're ones that know who they are enough to affirm who others are. And, uh, and this is what God is doing. He wants to mature his church. And, and uh, so I just want to share. I'm going to pray real quick and then we'll jump right in. God, we just thank you. We thank you that you're breathing on your church. We thank you that you're building a family in this city and in cities around the world. And we thank you that we get to be a part of that, God, that the dream involves us, that, that, God, you don't move just on our behalf, but you move in us and you move through us, that we are the plan A of God, which is really exciting and terrifying. <laughs> but we say yes again today in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you guys would turn to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, I'm going to jump into just one of my favorite stories. My prayer is that God would give you vision, that you'd see something today every time I preach a message there's a prayer connected to it. My prayer is that you'd actually see something because we can only live what we've already seen ourselves doing. This is why vision is so important. Many, it says in Proverbs 29, 18, it says this, that, that where there's no vision, people stumble all over themselves. This is happening in the church. It's happening in culture. It's happening in some of our families, that where there's no vision, we just stumble around in the dark, but when we attend to what God reveals, when we know what God's doing, we can do it with Him. And this is why we need vision, because we only, we only do those things we've already seen ourselves doing. No one stumbles into destiny. You see it, and then you do it. How many of you, whenever you get a chance, you lay hands on the sick, and you pray that God might heal them? Just be honest, how many? A couple of us. Okay, I would venture that the ones that aren't doing that are because you have no vision for it. And the ones that are doing it, you've already seen yourselves putting hands on people, you've seen people getting healed, because in worship, God opens our eyes, in prayer, we begin to see things, and when you can see it, you can build it. Now, we believe that one of the things God's doing on the earth, I would say the biggest thing he's doing, he's building a family on the earth, he always has been. And so God's building a, a family. This is, the church is not an institution first, it's not an organization. It's a family, sons and daughters, fathers and mothers. He's building a family. But if we're going to build a family with God, we've got to see it before we can build it. And I know that the vision here is build, building a family, making it home. And if we're really going to build family and we're going to make it home, we've got to see it first. So my prayer is that you'd get a glimpse today. You'd get a small glimpse 
and that you'd be able to go, wow, I can do that. Now that I've seen it, I can do it. So in 1 Samuel 16, it says this, The Lord said to Samuel, The prophet, you've mourned long enough for Saul. I've rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with oil. Go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I've chosen one of his sons to be my king. So here's this moment in the story where God speaks to Samuel. Now at this point, um, Samuel is the prophet, and, uh, and the, the, the people of God, they, they said, we want a king, right? Remember that? We want a king. We want a man king. God was always meant to be their king. And God said, no, you don't want a man king. You want a God king. I'm a much better king. You don't want a man king. And they said, no, we want, we want a man king. We want a king. Why? Because we want to be like the other nations. The moment we stop being content with who we are and what we have, and we start comparing, we want to be like someone else, the moment we stop being fixated on, on who he is, and who he's made us to be, and we become consumed with who we aren't and all those things we don't yet have. It's at that point that we begin to drift and we stop walking in destiny. And, and they just said, we want to we be like the other nations. And God's like, no, no, no. You were called to be like no nation on the earth because you are meant to reflect God to all the nations. And they said, no, we, wanna, we want a man king. And so uh, Samuel um, chooses Saul, and you know the story of Saul. Saul feared man more than he feared God. He lived a life of fear, and, and God loves you, but when we live in fear, God can't actually use us. Like, fear is one of those things. It's, I think it's the, the most tolerated sin in the, in the church. There's all the, if you, if you steal, I'll confront you. If you're a total jerk, I'll tell you. You know what I mean? But we allow, we allow people to live in fear their whole lives. We never call them out of fear. And so here's Saul that, that feared man, and God's like, Saul, you keep, you're afraid of people, and when you're afraid of people, you can't lead people, and you can't love people. And so what God does, he rejects Saul as his king, and here's God, he's about to choose a king after his own heart. He says to Samuel, I'm about to choose a king, the son of a man named Jesse. And, and so here's Samuel, in verse 2, Samuel said, well, how can I do this? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. God says, take a heifer with you. Listen, if you're ever afraid, has God ever asked you to do something that's just totally terrifying? And you're like, God, I'm scared. Just take a heifer. A female cow. So Samuel did as God instructed, and he shows up in Bethlehem. And verse 6, when he arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, the oldest, and thought, surely this is God's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I love this verse. It's one of the best verses in the Bible. That, that man, we, we see, we worship image, we worship appearance. We make all kinds of judgments the moment we see someone, but God sees beyond all of that. God sees to the heart. God says to Samuel here, his prophet, Samuel, you're doing what men do. You're, you're looking at the outward appearance. You're looking at the strongest. You're looking at the one that you think might be the most spiritual, the, the one who's the most sexy. You're looking at the outward appearance. God sees something deeper than skin. You've got to learn, he says, Samuel, you've got to learn to see what God sees. You've got to train your eyes to begin to see the heart. And then it says that all seven of Samuel's, or of Jesse's sons, were brought before the prophet Samuel. And as each one of these sons came before the prophet, God said, this isn't the one. So finally, Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any others? And Jesse says, well, I have, I have one more, one more son, but he's the youngest, and he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. And I love this because this word youngest in the, in the Hebrew culture here, it actually was a derogatory term. So this doesn't just mean he's the youngest in age, it means he's actually the least and he's out watching the sheep and the goats. He's a shepherd, and the shepherd was the most least desired job in this culture. So pretty much, Jesse's like, yeah, I have one more, but he's the least of the least. And, and I love what Samuel says here. He says, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his seven brothers, 
Samuel took the flask of olive oil and he anointed David with the oil. And it says this, that the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Now, isn't this the dream of heaven? That the spirit of God would come upon his people. Like, isn't this every father's dream? Isn't this every mother's dream that the spirit of God would come upon our sons and our daughters from that day on? Isn't that what we're asking God to do? We're just saying, God, would you send your spirit? Would you encounter our sons and our daughters in such a way from that day on? It said that God moved in David's life. David had an experience with God that changed him from that day on. Do you know, do you know that one encounter with God changes everything? The spirit of God came upon young David's life. So here's the moment in the story of God where God is looking for the next king. He's about to anoint the next leader. It's that moment he finds David in the field. There's so much talk about us finding God. You know God finds you. There's so much talk about us pursuing him. You know he pursues you. <laughs> if God can find Moses in the wilderness, if God can find Daniel in, in the den, if God can find Jonah in the whale, if God can find Esther in captivity, if God can find Paul on that road to Damascus, if God can find David in the field, God can find you. And here's the moment that God finds David. And what's so profound here in this, in this moment is when God finds David, what does he do? He sends Samuel. When God finds David, he sends Samuel. When God finds a son, what does he do? He sends a spiritual father. When God finds a generation after his own heart, what does he do? He sends a generation of fathers and mothers after his own heart. God doesn't speak to David about David. God speaks to Samuel about David. God could just show up and encounter David, but why would God send Samuel? Because everything God does, he does through family. God is building a family and he will speak to fathers about sons and mothers about daughters because this is what God is up to. When he finds David, he sends Samuel. And here's Samuel that hears the voice of God. What's the first thing God says to Samuel in this story? In verse one, this is what God says to Samuel. You've mourned long. Because here's Samuel. Samuel's the one that, that partnered with God to choose Saul, the king who failed Israel. Imagine being the guy that anoints the king who failed God and failed Israel. So Samuel's living in a chapter of his life called failure. Samuel's living in the disappointment. He's living in the discouragement. He was faithful. He did what he could do. Have you ever been absolutely wholeheartedly faithful to God and you did it and it failed? The relationship fell apart. The, the marriage crumbled. The, the family drifted. The, the dream never happened. You put your hands on that thing you thought God was on and it, and it just fell apart. Here's Samuel and Samuel's living in discouragement. He's been mourning the loss of Saul, the one that he anointed in front of everyone. He put his hands on this young man, the spiritual son, and the spiritual son lived in fear rather than faith. And, and so God speaks to Samuel here, and he says, Samuel, you've mourned long enough. And we know the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We know that, that mourning is an invitation to actually face the pain. God is asking Samuel to face the disappointment to face the loss, to face the pain. But here's what happened is so many of us, like it doesn't happen the way we thought it would happen. The dream falls apart. The, the relationship falls apart. The marriage falls apart. The thing that we put our hands on, that we thought God's hands was on it, 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 it falls apart. And, and what happens is too many of us, we actually get stuck in our failure. Our own kids aren't following Jesus, so we think, well, I could never be a spiritual dad or a spiritual mom. And many of us, we, we actually, we get stuck in disappointment. We get stuck in discouragement. And, and this is why God shows up and he says to Samuel, you've mourned long enough. And here's the thing. God doesn't edit your story. 
Like you're holy because God tells your whole story. And I, th- I think sometimes too often we want to come to church and we want to come to God and we want to bring all the sexy scenes, right? We want to bring all those parts of our, our life that we're proud of and, and yet God wants your whole story. Here's the thing. When you only bring the scenes you're proud of, you're actually robbing the world of an encounter with Jesus. Because do you realize your whole story reveals his whole grace? He wants your whole story, and yet what happens is we hide these parts of our story, and instead of mourning them, instead of actually bringing them to God, you know mourning is, is an act of worship where you bring your pain, you bring your disappointment, you bring your loss to God. Do you know that, you know that being weak doesn't mean that you don't have faith? It just means you're like Jesus. Because Jesus was the one that bled on the cross. Jesus was the one that, that, that wept before his father in the garden. We, we, sometimes we think, well, we have to be strong. No, actually being weak and being vulnerable and becoming authentic and bringing the scenes to God and the parts of your life and the chapters you're most ashamed of is actually becoming more and more like him. God wants your whole story, every part of you. It's not really worship unless you bring the whole thing to him. Too often we're hiding parts of ourself to God. Worship is, God, you can have all of me. And God has never been ashamed of you, not once. Your whole story reveals his whole grace. When we hide parts of our story, we hide parts of God. Because God wants to move through every scene and every chapter of our life. But here's the thing, you can't allow one chapter of your story to become the whole story. And this is what happens. We, we bring our whole life to God, but you can't allow one chapter. And people get stuck in a chapter. They get stuck in chapter 5, and it begins to define them. When you live in pain for too long, it actually defines you. When you live in disappointment for too long, it actually becomes your story. When we live in grief, when we actually live in the cave too long, it becomes the most powerful scene in our story. And one chapter of your story was never meant to define you. Pain and disappointment and loss will happen. It is part of every one of our stories. It was a part of Jesus' story. It was never meant to define us. And God knows, and I love this about God, God knows exactly how to meet us in our failure and how to call us out. There are divine moments in every one of our stories Where God shows up, he meets us in our pain, but he loves us too much to leave us in our pain. And he meets us in our failure. He is so good, he pursues us in the loss. Some of us, you feel like God's abandoned you because you feel alone, but here's, here's the thing. Loneliness is never, it is never that God's abandoned you. Loneliness is always an invitation to know the one who has never abandoned you. And so God meets us in our pain, and here's God who encounters Samuel and says, you've mourned long enough, you've mourned. You're facing the pain. Here's the thing. If you can face it, God will fight it. And God doesn't heal you around pain. He heals you through pain. God doesn't heal you around anxiety. He heals you through anxiety. God doesn't take depression from you. He heals you through depression. God says, will you bring it to me as an act of worship? God heals us through it. God empowers us to overcome it because once you can overcome it, you can overcome anything. And too often we're like, God, would you take this from me? And he's like, I'm not going to take it from you, but I will meet you in it. You've mourned long enough. How many of us in here, God is saying, you've mourned long enough. You've sat in the shame for long enough. You've lived in the shadows for long enough. You've been in the sixth row for long enough. You got stuck for long enough. It's time to walk into the fullness of your destiny, but you can't walk into the fullness until you actually face the pain in your life. You've got to learn to bleed in community, and many of us, we don't want to bleed because we thought we had to be strong, but God's saying, if you don't learn how to bleed, which is exactly what Jesus did, if you don't bleed, you'll never dream. The most courageous thing Jesus ever did was bleed. Listen, the most power released on the earth came from a man broken and bleeding on a cross. What does that say about the power of pain? When we allow God to meet us in it, you've mourned long enough. And then God says to Samuel, fill your flask. Face the pain and now get filled again. Get filled again. Fill the same flask. Imagine Samuel in this moment thinking, oh God, I did that before. 
God, I'm not filling that flask again. We tried that. Has God ever asked you to do it again? To throw the same nets back in? To go back to Egypt again? To go back the same way like God said to Elijah? To fill the same flask? God, I'm not trying that again. But here's the thing about God. Just because you failed once doesn't mean God won't ask you to do it again. And most likely he will ask you to do it again because God's about to redeem it. God redeems all things. That's the promise. It's in the place of our failure that God will empower us again. And we're like, oh God, not that flask again. But imagine being Samuel. Imagine not being full. And I think so many of us, like our flasks are full. Let's be honest. Our flasks are full. Or some of us, are, our, our flasks are, 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 are full of the wrong thing. Some of us, our flasks are empty. And we just have nothing. If you're honest, some of us, we're, it, we're full of our, our career. We're, we're full of th this dream that has nothing to do with the kingdom. Some of us, we're just, our lives are full of ourselves. And God is saying, will you get filled up again? Will you get filled with the Spirit of God again? Because it's when I'm filled with His presence, when I'm filled with the Spirit, I can actually see the David that God's about to anoint. Do you know you can't see people when you're filled with yourself? You can't even see the Davids. Imagine being Samuel. You know David, a man after God's own heart. And here's David. He's like one of the greatest men of God in all the Bible. Imagine being Samuel and coming face to face with David. You're here to anoint the next king, but you have no oil in your flask. You have nothing to give. And that's why God is saying to fathers and mothers in the church, he's saying, you've mourned long enough. He's calling you out of that. I want to heal you so you can get whole and full again. And he says, Fill your flask again. Get filled up, because when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I can overflow on sons and daughters. When I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I can actually see what God is seeing. Get filled up again. How many, how many of you here, it's time to get filled again? You've been empty for, for so long, it's actually defined you. That God is saying, get filled with my Spirit again so you can see sons and and daughters again. And then what's so interesting next is God says to Samuel, he says this, there's a man named Jesse, I've chosen his son. And I'm reading this part of the story and I'm thinking, God, if you know Jesse's name, then of course you know David's name. Why would you give Samuel Jesse's name, but not David's name? Hmm. Why not just say, hey, there's a dude named David in a field. Because God will not call David without involving his father, Jesse. Because God is building family. And even though Jesse rejected his son, didn't even invite him to the party, God's like, hey, we're going to find Jesse because he's going to see his son get anointed. I want Jesse to see what I'm about to do in his son's life. And at the same time, God, as much as he's growing David to become the king that God sees in him, he's actually growing Samuel because he's saying, Samuel, he's saying to a spiritual father, he's saying to a spiritual mother, I want to grow you too to be able to see the Davids that I'm bringing your way. He's growing Samuel. He's saying, hey, Samuel, if I, if I tell you everything, you never have to grow in hearing my voice. I'm not going to give you everything. And I know some of us are like, I I'm not stepping out in faith until I have the full GPS, right? Well, that's not faith. Sometimes God gives you Jesse's name, but you don't get David's name until you're along the way. And so he's growing Samuel. I believe God is raising up the Samuels in the church, the fathers and mothers. This isn't an age thing. It's a calling thing. He's raising up fathers and mothers in experienced church in this city, in this region, who get filled with the Spirit of God, who can face their pain in a way that they actually get healed and whole so they can, be, they can be the ones that God sends to the Davids to lay hands on them and anoint the next generation for their calling. I was preaching um, uh, this message in San Jose um, last year. And I woke up that morning and, and I'll pray before a gathering and I'll just say, God, what are you saying? What are you doing? And, and the Lord said this. He said, David's here. David's here. And I said, okay. I said, that's great. And I just assumed like David, the David generation, right? And uh, so after, after I preached this message, uh, I just sensed that God wanted uh, um, to, to call home the sons and the daughters, the Davids, that God was about to anoint them, that the Spirit of God was about to come upon a generation. 
And so I, I said, are there any Davids here? Are there any Davids that, that just sense the call of God and, and you're ready to come and stand in the presence and you're ready to have the Spirit of God come upon you? And, and no one stood at all. And uh, when you're a pastor and a preacher and in this kind of situation, what they teach you in seminary is just close your eyes and do this. <laughs> Everyone thinks you're praying, but really you're not. You're, you're absolutely stressing like and embarrassed. And so I just did this. And then all of a sudden in, in the back of the room, this young boy, he stands up. The moment he stood up, 15 other young men stood up all across the room. It only took one. It only took one. And I said to him, I said, son, what's your name? He said, my name's David. <laughs> and I said, David, will you come forward? And he said, absolutely. He came to the front of the church. He had this shirt on, and, and the shirt said, I must go. And, and I said, church, you will believe this. David's here. His shirt said, I must go. And I said, what does your shirt say? And then I looked a little closer. It says, I must go. Video games are calling. <laughs> I said, God's about to rewrite your shirt, buddy. It's about the call of God's coming to you. And we prayed over him. And, and as we begin to pray over him, his dad stands up from the back of the room, jumps to his feet, comes running down the aisle and laid both hands on his son and began to weep over his young boy. Listen, I preached a message that morning, but the greatest message wasn't the one I preached. It was one that father lived. I promise you, no one in that place remembers my message. They will never forget that moment. And then mothers and fathers got up all over the room and they began running. The, the other young men and women came forward and fathers and mothers came and laid their hands on them. And we just prayed and we just said, God, would you release everything you have for these young Davids? God is raising up Samuels in the church. I think the Samuels are this lost generation because too often it's all the emphasis is on these young leaders with skinny jeans and they play acoustic guitar and, and you have fathers and mothers who are wondering, where is my place at all? But here's the thing, when God sees a generation after his own heart, he sends a generation of fathers and mothers. Will we imagine experienced church if, if God is really building a family in this city, in this region, then God is calling. This is what he's doing. He's speaking to fathers and mothers. He's saying, will you allow me to flood your life with my presence? Would you become fierce to get to sons and daughters? And I love in this story that, that, that moment where Samuel says, send for him. Send for him. Imagine if every son and daughter was sent for. Was sent for. And if we wait, listen church, if we wait for them to come to our gatherings, they will live and die without Jesus. And we will live and die without a legacy. We cannot, we have to move, listen, we have to move beyond the gatherings into the fatherings and motherings. I feel like the Lord said we have to move beyond the experience into the embrace. Because, listen, this will not, none of this happens in church. This is not a church thing, it's a life thing. So if we're just waiting for sons and daughters to, to come to our gatherings, they, they will not encounter Jesus. This is why Jesus said go. This is why Jesus left heaven, he came. What did he do? This is what Jesus did. He laid his hands on, on a handful of young disciples. He gave his life to them. Listen, we can build a great church and, and have very few sons and daughters. But when we give ourselves to build sons and daughters, we will always have a great church. That is what God's doing. Family, listen, when we talk about a family culture, family culture is not just, hey, we hang out, we drink coffee, and we, and we love to connect. Family is about fierce fathers and mothers who will give their lives to get to sons and daughters, who will not get stuck in their own shame. What's happened is too many fathers and mothers feel like they blew it, they didn't follow Jesus well, they didn't set the example, and so they're stuck. They're stuck in their own pain, they're stuck in their own shame, so they aren't fierce for their sons and their daughters. So what we have a whole generation of passive fathers and mothers who got stuck in their shame and their failure and their disappointment. And God is saying it's time to come out. It's time to come out. Face it so you can get healed, so you can become whole, so you can get filled with God's spirit again and get fierce with your sons and daughters. And what's so redemptive about this story is, is here's, here's Samuel his own sons didn't love God. 
His own sons were actually evil and, and, and violent. And, and maybe one of the most tragic verses in the Bible, it said, it says Samuel's sons wanted nothing to do with God. So how does God redeem a dad's life by bringing him a spiritual son? Here's David, whose dad doesn't even invite him to the party, who doesn't see the king in him, who doesn't believe in him at all. How does God redeem David's life? By bringing him a spiritual dad. So the redemptive work of God in God's family to take fathers and mothers who feel like they've blown it and bring them spiritual sons and daughters. To take sons and daughters who are fatherless and have no mothers in their life or moms on drugs or whatever it is and bring them into a spiritual family to say, you're so worth it. I'm building a family. Watch what I'm about to do. A couple years ago, there was a, a gathering. There was an event called a, a Susan Now. You probably heard about it. It was down in L.A. and there were uh, almost 100,000 that gathered to worship God and and I really wanted to be at this gathering. Friends from all over the world were calling me and saying, hey, Nate, you're going right. It's in your backyard, which when you're from Norway, I guess LA seems like it's in Redding's backyard. <laughs> but our daughter, Adia, had a, a soccer tournament that weekend. And, and as much as I was torn and wanted to be at this, this stadium worship gathering, we made a decision to stay home and to cheer our daughter on playing soccer. And I remember that morning we woke up as she was beginning to play her first game and I was, I was living vicariously through Instagram and I was scrolling and all these pictures of the stadium being filled and people worshiping and encountering God. And then my daughter began to score and very quickly. The Instagram paled in comparison to her game. And I remember having this thought, as much as I would love to be at that stadium in LA, there is no place I would rather be than watching you on this field. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, that's what I think about you. And had this beautiful encounter with God. And, and then later that day, we took our kids home and we were around the table in our living room. And, and we were watching a Susan now, this, this worship day online. And every time someone was preaching, our kids would get distracted and they would walk away. But every time there was worship, they would gather around the table and they would sing the songs with us. And I remember thinking, wow, I would, I would love to hear a thousand or 100,000 worshiping God right now. But that would pale in comparison to hearing my daughter sing. And as much as I love watching on this screen a stadium being filled, that's nothing compared to my son being filled. And I had this moment where I, the Lord spoke to me. We were around a table and we were in our living room and we were worshiping together. And, and the Lord said, this is revival. Revival looks like family. Revival looks like fathers and mothers, fierce to get to sons and daughters. This is revival, sons and daughters filled with my spirit, singing and worshiping me. I felt like the Lord said, I've called you to a table. And then God reaffirmed something he had been speaking to me. He said, Nate, I know when you were young and you first started your church, you wanted a big church, but he said, you're not going to pastor a big church. But I will give you big sons and daughters. And now I could care less about the size of, of our church, but I care deeply about the size of our people. And I tell our church all the time, I'm like, I could care less how big this gets. I really care how big you get. Revival looks like family. He's calling us to a table. We've mourned long enough. It's time to get filled up. It's time to get fierce again. Will you get fierce beyond your own pain and your own shame? Are you going to allow, imagine if Samuel gets stuck in his failure, David gets stuck in the field. Are you going to allow your own pain to keep your kids from their destiny? Are you going to allow your own disappointment to keep you from being bold? Are you, are you going to allow the thing that happened to you to be the thing that keeps them from everything God has? Because God anoints a generation through a generation. There is something so profound when we embrace and we lay hands on the next generation and they come alive in their destiny. So I want to pray right now. Holy Spirit, come. Spirit of God, come. You guys can keep your eyes open. You don't have to close your eyes. I don't think Jesus ever said close your eyes in prayer. I want you to see this. Come on. Holy Spirit, come. Spirit of God, come. 
If you're here and you sense God is saying to you, you've mourned long enough. You've been in the shadows long enough. You've been disappointed long enough. You've been stuck there long enough. You've been in shame long enough. You've been discouraged long enough. If that's you, just stand right now. Be bold. Stand right now. Stand wherever you're at. It's been long enough. If you're here and you sense God saying, it's time to get filled up again. It's time to get filled with God's spirit again. You're filled with the wrong things or you're filled with nothing. Some of you right now, it's time to stand and go. It's time to get filled with God's spirit again. Holy Spirit, come. I was praying and I just had this clear picture. I saw God. I saw his hand on fathers and mothers. I saw the anointing, the the power of God power of God come upon fathers and mothers to actually get to sons and daughters. God wants to release something through your life. Samuel had no idea that King David was on the other side of his failure. He had no idea. You have no idea what son or daughter. You have no idea. You're about to lay your hands on sons and daughters. You're about to embrace them. There's a young man in in our church named John that, that came to our church about five, six years ago, a radical encounter with Jesus. He ended up on our worship team and ended up drumming. And a couple years later, he fell back into his old life and started partying again. And I felt like the Lord said to me one day, he said, don't let him go. Don't let him go. This was never about church. It was about family. Don't let him go. And so I started texting him every week. Every time I'd see him around town, I'd embrace him. I'd smile. I'd pray for him. I'd bless him. I'd do whatever I could to say, I am not going anywhere. I'm going to be a papa in your life, John. Every time I'd see him, he, uh, he bumped into me about two years ago. And he said, Nate, he said, no one's ever loved me like the Stirring family. And I said, we will love you regardless of who you are, where you've been. And then he bailed again for a year. I I bumped into him once in in Safeway in our city, and he was holding this big bottle of vodka. And I remember seeing him, and I saw the bottle, and I saw him, and I just smiled, and I gave him a big embrace and said, I love you, bro. I didn't know this, but three months later, he showed up at church, and he said, Nate, he said, "I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm so broken. I'm so lost. But you guys have loved me so well. This is what he said to me. He said, hell, you saw me with vodka and you still loved me. (laughs) He said, after I hugged him, he went into his car and he cried for 20 minutes. I haven't seen him for months now. Last night at midnight, I get a text from John, which was so cool because I knew I was preaching on this today. Last night he says this, for whatever reason, I'm getting wrecked in every second of my life. I'm so messed up, I'm so broken. All I know is I need family. I don't know what else to say. You're that family and you know that. I'm tired of pretending. Let's get some root stuff out. I'm tired of being a coward. I'm ready to become a son. So if you guys would just put your hands out and let me just pray a bold prayer over you. I'm asking God to to move not, not just in you, but through you right now. This is a prayer not just for you. It can't stay with you. I'm asking God to actually anoint you. I'm praying for the sons and daughters that God's about to send to you and he's about to send you to. They're in our church. They're in our city. They work with us. I love that David's in a field because I really felt like Mark. I feel like the Lord, I woke up this morning and I feel like the Lord said that you're raising up fathers for the fields. You're raising up mothers for the fields, the industries, and business and tech and, and, and coffee and, and education and government. I felt like there's a real mantle mark on your and Amanda life to raise up fathers and mothers for the fields. So Holy Spirit, would you come? And I just pray for a fierce anointing on these fathers and mothers to actually face pain to bleed in family, 
to bleed enough to dream again. I pray you'd fill them with your spirit again, God. As much as you, you were growing, Samuel, would you grow us to see the Davids, God? To see the Davids. To see the Davids, God. To embrace sons and daughters, to lay hands on sons and daughters, to prophesy over sons and daughters, to not be passive. We lay down passivity right now. We will not be a passive church. This is how God builds family. He doesn't build family through gatherings. He builds family through fatherings and motherings. Fierce moms and dads who will leap over every chair and every row to get to sons and daughters to remind them who they are. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on.